Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of Warrington Borough Council's Cabinet on Monday the 13th of July. Um, at the meeting tonight we've got eight councillors, myself, Councillor Russ Bowden, Councillor Judith Guthrie, Councillor Tony Higgins, Councillor Rebecca Knowles, uh, Councillor Cathy Mitchell, Councillor Hans Mundry, Councillor Hitesh Patel, Councillor Matt Smith. I'm also joined by uh, senior officers of the council, uh, Stephen Broomhead, Amanda Amesbury, Paul Clisby and Linton Green. Um, colleagues will remember from uh, the last meeting that we had a presentation regarding uh, the impact of um, COVID-19 on Warrington and the great work that's been done by the council. And um, we've got a similar presentation tonight uh, regarding the impact of lockdown on our children here in the town. Uh, is it the will of the meeting that we hear that presentation uh, before starting the formal meeting? Yes. Yes, good, oh. agreed. OK, thank you for that, colleagues. In which case, I'll hand over to Councillor Matt Smith um, to lead us through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last month, the charity the Ch Childhood Trust produced a report titled Children in Lockdown, in which they looked at the consequences of the lo lockdown period on children in poverty. The Trust is focused on Warrington, but the themes outlined in it are relevant across the country, including in Warrington. I'm just going to highlight the areas considered by the report, then I'll hand over to Amanda Amesbury who will take us through the local picture, including what we know, what we have done and the difference we've made in each area. The report describes the impact of lockdown in six areas. These are emotional and physical abuse where children are spending more time at home, a home potentially under increased pressure due to unemployment and other financial issues, where they might witness domestic abuse or be subject to emotional or physical abuse. Mental health concerns. Children are understandably anxious about the virus, concerned about their futures, not spending time with friends, but spending more time online whilst having less access to the usual mental health support services. Educational learning loss. Disadvantaged children are more likely to fall behind with remote learning due to limited access to technology, a less stable learning environment and restricted supervision and guidance. This will widen the attainment gap for these children. Hunger and food insecurity. For some disadvantaged children, the free school meal is their only hot meal of the day. Hunger and malnutrition are a real concern, which the well publicised problems with the National Free School Meals voucher system did not adequately address. Homelessness and temporary housing risks. Families in these situations might find it difficult to maintain social distancing or may have to share kitchen and bathroom facilities, putting them at increased risk. Lastly, playtime and well-being. Play is, a, is crucial for the health and development of children and young people. Access to outdoor areas and spending time with other children will be an essential part of the recovery process going forward. So with that, I'll hand over to Amanda, who will take us through the local context and our strong responses in Warrington. Thank you, Councillor Smith. So uh, if we just move to the next slide, please, Chris. So just the context, I think Councillor Smith has kind of run us through that, but the Childhood Trust, the, the, what, I, what I would say to members is the big, the big message that I would give there is that the disadvantage gap that already exists for children and young people. The report exemplifies in all of the areas Councillor Smith has talked you through how that disadvantage gap is likely to increase as a result of um, COVID for our most vulnerable children in the borough. So next slide, please, Chris. OK, so running through each of the areas that the report highlighted, not necessarily in the order that they are uh, as they're laid out, as Councillor Smith laid them out, but starting with childhood, child uh, development concerns. So um, we know that across the country, health screening checks stopped at the start of the um, pandemic as we all went into lockdown. And we know that in Warrington, as well as across the country, there was issues with early years providers closing down as well. Um, 262 children of critical care workers continue to attend the setting every day, but for a number, for the vast majority of our children, those settings closed down at the start. Um, we know that we had lower levels of children attending early years settings throughout. So the response that we've had in Warrington was to work with our, 
our, our commission services, our providers and, and with our CCGU supporters and commissioning these services as well to make sure that antenatal pre-birth safeguarding visits to our most vulnerable children continued right the way throughout, including six to eight week contacts and the two to two and a half year developmental checks so that we have a baseline for the developmental progress our children are making. We made sure that a high number of providers stayed open for our children, particularly stayed open for children of critical key workers on the front line. Um, and we made sure that they have a wider reopening from June. A virtual offer continued from the providers um, and our council run services and our send offers continued on a digital platform throughout the early period and increasingly as we've introduced more face to face direct um, access to early years providers. Next slide please Chris. So what difference do we think we've made? 99% of early years group based provision is, is now open and has remained open with 33% of our child minders. That's a high percentage compared to the data that we're getting through from other local authorities and we're proud of that in Warrington. 50% of eligible children are accessing childcare and um, vulnerable children accessing childcare has increased by 95%. So that's a positive story for us. Really crucial this area of the report in terms of these early years being the formative years of, of a child's life where they learn speech and language skills and um, skills that they take throughout, throughout adulthood that we know from lots and lots of research really impact on children's outcomes in the long term. So next slide please Chris. Education learning loss. So we know um, that lots of schools have closed, um, well all schools closed as, as, um, as the government announced the closure. Pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds have less access to learning resources and support to promote the learning. The disadvantage attainment gap is expected to increase as a result of lockdown. So the actions that we've taken in Warrington, almost all our schools have remained open. In fact, it, it's my understanding that only three have closed during, during the period and the three that have closed have continued to offer online different platforms of learning for children and to keep in touch with their children. We've developed a learning resource lockdown resource pack for our schools that have gone out. We've distributed a number of laptops. We've had really high levels and I've just looked today at the data for this week um, and 95% of children were contacted by schools uh, this week so that's a really positive picture regular checks and calls to our most vulnerable children and young people so what difference have we made I think it's the next slide please Chris okay so um, our children with special educational needs of had support to attend school on a regular basis where they've not been going into school we have offered digital platforms and made resources available to the teachers and the teachers have kept in touch with those children our schools have operated at full covid capacity so not full capacity but full covid capacity so the amount of children who we can physically get into schools at this moment in time paula tells us are attending schools We've had some really positive feedback from parents about the support that have been offered, particularly supporting children with special educational needs and disabilities, which we've been really pleased with. And there's a there's a quote there for people to have a look at about the impact that we've had for one parent whose child was able to access educational provision. Next slide, please. So hunger and food poverty. Um, so we've seen a not we've seen a, a, I mean I was quite taken aback by the the data here we've seen a significant increase in the numbers of people Warrington people who were claiming vet benefits during this pe this period we've seen an increase in the um, numbers of children who are eligible for, eligible for school free school meals and we've seen an increase in the uh, numbers of families who've approached the councils for access to food banks and uh, food to feed their children. So next slide, please, Chris. So what have we done? We've provided supermarket vouchers for our children. That's been that we've supplemented the government scheme there where the school government scheme wasn't available to start with or there was delay in that provision coming through. We've supplemented that. Our Safe and Well service have distributed food parcels to our vulnerable children and their families. 
we and we've increased the maintenance payment to our, our care leavers who are a particularly vulnerable group. Difference that we've made, we've continued to ensure that children who are entitled to school, free school meals have access to, to vouchers at all times. And we've the, the report that um, Councillor Smith referred to was written before it was agreed to extend the free school meals uh, over the school, the forthcoming school holiday period. But what I think um, you might need to be aware of is that the, the forthcoming period of free school meals still doesn't cover years 11 to year 13. So we will continue to support those children locally throughout the summer, in addition to the national voucher scheme. Next slide, please, Chris. Housing and homelessness. So the, um, the risks here are really looming because uh, landlords haven't been able to evict people during the lockdown. So come August, we think that we might see more children and families being evicted from, from their properties than what we actually have so far. Um, so we need to keep a watchful eye on that and we need to keep working with, with, with um, our housing offer to make sure that we can continue to support those families from August. Um, we've struggled to find uh, suitable accommodation for some of our children in care who've needed to move placements or who've become looked after. A particular issue that I've been dealing with just today has been the availability of mother and baby units for often very young, vulnerable mums, sometimes dads, but generally mums, who need to be placed alongside uh, their children from birth. And uh, those placements have all been taken up because nobody's been moving out of them. So there's been a real shortage around that. And we've had to do some pretty imaginative work, even just in the last four days and today, in providing a different offer and wraparound support to those children. We've had four young people present as homeless since lockdown began. That's not an unusual figure. That's not an increase on what we would normally expect to see. But I think it's important to just note that we have housed all those young people and we have been able to meet their needs um, in suitable accommodation. Next slide, please, Chris. OK, so uh, what have we done? Housing Plus services continued to utilise the stock of temporary available accommodation that they've got. Uh, members know that we opened a children's home and we opened it at supersonic speed, Warrington only speed within 24 hours that we continue to be in the process of registering with Ofsted now. Differences that we've made, we've supported a lot of families and a lot of children to stay in their own homes during this period and we've definitely provided a good response to children who've been who've presented as homeless. That's a particular strength that we've got anyway. You'll remember that that was a strength from our Ofsted report. Next slide, please, Chris. Access to outdoor spaces, physical activity and youth support. Um, social interaction and play is critical to children's development. The closure of um, our parks and our community spaces and the play areas within those parks, even as, as those bigger, bigger spaces have opened up, has been a worry for us because children uh, learn through play um, and children learn through risky play. You won't find any of us in the council not wanting a child to climb up a climbing frame for fear they might fall off and break their arm because actually it's really important that children engage in, in play and in risky play as well to learn, to learn about life. So during lockdown, opportunities have reduced for children to go to those play areas or to go to youth clubs, et cetera, where they can um, just have some family, some time outside of the family home. And obviously the, the, the issues that come from that is that um, they've not been able to see other people. If there are any safeguarding issues, we've not been as easily able to find out about them because our children haven't had those interactions outside of, outside of the family home as much. So what have we done? The youth services continued, continued on a digital platform. They've continued to have contact with high numbers of children throughout. Uh, targeted services such as drug and alcohol have continued throughout the throughout the pandemic, throughout the lockdown as well. And um, people will know we had our moment of glory on the news where one of we did some we we showed um, what our edge care offer that we've developed during COVID has been with use of um, Orford Hub. So that's been really positive and we've had some really good outcomes from there and online resources have been provided to schools around healthy relationships, risky behaviours, etc. that schools and past the pastoral offer within our schools have been able to use for our children. Next slide please Chris. OK, so what difference have, have we um, made? Um, we have 
what what difference have we made? I just don't want to repeat myself really, which a lot of this slide does. We've, we've just continued to offer those services around risky behaviours and the programmes that have been going. But things have moved to a digital platform. What we've actually found, and we found this across the whole array of our work, that children have engaged more quite often with us on a digital platform. They found it easier to talk. In social work, we've had a number of disclosures that have come um, through that, through talking digitally, through Zoom and Skype and God knows what to our children. So that's probably something that we will take into the future with us as a different way of working as well. Not that we'll ever stop face-to-face -face contact because that's critical, but I think that's uh, something that will continue. Next slide, please, Chris. Emotional and physical abuse. It's quite interesting. We've seen a reduction in the numbers of contacts, yet we've seen an increase in the numbers of referrals over time. And you can see month by month how that's dipped and then ebbed and then come, come up to more business as usual levels as, as we've gone through. So a contact would be somebody contacting us to say, can you can you tell us how we get in touch with the safe and well service so we can get a food package? We would just record that as a contact. It would not become a referral. A referral is when um, a child needs a social work response. So we've had a, we've had an increase in referral, but a reducing in those contacts. Uh, we see more referrals coming from the police and less, as you might expect, from schools and from our health providers. We did have some uh, conversations with health about the lower numbers of referrals, and you can see they went back up again over time and then plateaued again. But again, this month, the June data, which isn't up there, they've increased again. We've seen an increase in domestic abuse referrals. The data is there quite stark, 18 percent, and then over nearly 3000 increase in online um, hits on the Open the Door campaign from the PPC office. Um, we've seen an increase in contextual safeguarding issues, online abuse, um, children being contacted, and that's, that's national, but we have seen this locally as well, children being contacted online. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So what have we done about it? We've uh, risk assessed every single child that's open to a social worker. We've continued face to face visits in the vast majority of cases, certainly wherever needed. It was more difficult at the start of lockdown as we had an issue with PPE, but as that's got better through work of some colleagues on, on, on the, on the uh, teams today, we've um, we've been able to get out and see more and more ch children face to face. Seeing some really imaginative visits done in the garden, done at the front door where we've needed to, not always involving stepping over the threshold and going into somebody's house if anybody's displaying symptoms. Um, we've worked with our schools, we've seen th high numbers attending and our schools have been absolutely phenomenal in standing up to the challenge around making sure that they contact children who aren't attending, who've been identified by social workers as being more vulnerable. That's been a phenomenal response and my hat's off to all the teachers in the borough. Um, we, um, we have continued with our We Are With You, That's that was um, that's the um, contract that we have for missing from home service and interventions for children. So they've moved to um, an online resource. Uh, we've worked with the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office around supermarket campaigns and the Facebook Q&A around um, domestic abuse and, and, and violence. Um, what difference have we made? Um, we've seen, as I said, we've seen high levels of children attending schools um, hopefully um, I can say with confidence that I can give you assurance that we have continued to see the most vulnerable children in the borough. Next slide, please. Mental health concerns. Um, this for me is one of the long term, um, really long term um, issues that we need to keep an eye on because there's significant impact, likely long term effects that we don't, I don't think we've really got a measure of yet what that will look like in, in five years time. And there's some research done that says that mental health that trauma doesn't actually often come out in terms of, a, of, of your own mental health and well-being for up to nine years later. So we might be carrying the legacy of COVID for some time as a borough with our children's mental health, emotional well-being. Um, We've seen increases already in anxiety and depression, and we've seen um, increases in eating disorders and specialist services are reporting that they've seen an increase as well. So what have we done about it? 
We've improved our online resources where we've needed to put in that digital offer. We've um, made links with Cheshire University so that we're, we're really proud in Warrington of our trauma informed approach that's um, across our school system anyway, but we've worked with Cheshire University to build up um, support and um, packages to help our schools support children as they return in September. And we have continued with our regular visits to the most vulnerable children, be that through social workers and through social workers in our transition team as well. Um, what difference have we made? I think this is the final slide, Chris, moving over. OK, so um, we've supported many children to remain at home during this period. Period. We've um, we have had some tier four admissions, but those children were all returned home with packages of support, of support in place. And we've um, increased the packages of support available where we've needed to, to support these, these children who have got uh, some of the most complex difficulties. Thank you, any questions? Okay, thank you for that, um, Council Smith and, uh, and Amanda. Um, Matt, did you have any closing comments you wanted to make after the presentation? Uh, not particularly. I think it's, it's probably worth noting that um, the responses you heard there uh, regarding that report, really it wasn't that we were reacting to the report. These are things we already had in place and were developing uh, as we saw the situation unfold around us. Um, we, we've compared really well with lo other local authorities on measures like school attendance and things, and Amanda talks about those. Uh, and we, so we know we've, we've compared well there. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity really just to thank um, Amanda and Paula and all their teams for the incredible amount of hard work they've all put in um, to support our young people at this time because it has been incredible to watch. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you for those comments, um, Matt. I think I'd like to certainly like to echo um, your comment regarding thanks to all the staff, um, not just those in the council, but those in schools and with other partner organisations. I think. Um, you know, what, what we've heard in the presentation is consistent with a lot of the, the, um, the reporting that's happening nationally in terms of the impact on young people. And, um, and I think it's quite sobering, really, just to think about the long term effects um, that this particular lockdown may well have on children of all ages, you know, in terms of their development, but obviously in terms of their long term um, you know, health and attainment. Um, so um, there's obviously a lot of work to do, and I'm sure you know our colleagues in schools and other partner organisations will will be part of that journey with us. If, um, I, th I suppose we've got some time for any brief comments. If members have got any that they want to to raise, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask Matt and Amanda whether there are a few things um, that they may want to do differently coming out of COVID. That I think. It has been a terrible situation, but there also have been some positives and, and one of them, I think, is young people's familiarity with using digital platforms. Sometimes it is easier, particularly when they're feeling quite vulnerable or their families are feeling quite vulnerable to, to engage using technology in ways that we perhaps hadn't tried out before. So I just wondered if there are any comments on uh, on on the use of um, of those kind of platforms going forward and um, any any other things that uh, we're now doing differently um, that that we would carry on with? Okay, um, so we, we we've we, we've absolutely embraced the digital world. It's it's I'm, I'm I'm quite digital savvy. I used to pride myself on, but actually I've learned an awful lot myself. We've really embraced a, a different culture, a different way of working. Um, we're a bit shell-shocked to start with because social work is all about people and it's all about relationships and that's absolutely critical um, as I talked about social work there the whole of the children's workforce it's all about relationships and partnerships so we uh, were a bit shell-shocked as I said to start with of how we were going to do it differently we have maintained as I've said face-to-face -face visits and face-to-face -face contact wherever that's been needed and to meet our statutory obligations 
but we've absolutely embraced and some of our children have taught us how to embrace the digital world. So I've seen beautiful write ups of direct work that's been done over a computer with a child on a screen like I'm talking to you and, and whoever's listening from Warrington Borough now. Um, and it's been amazing to see. And as I said, I think in the, in the presentation, children have told us things that we don't think they would have told us had it actually been in, in a room together or wherever in a park together or whatever. Ever. So we will absolutely take that forward and continue that in our future working. The other thing is that we've been able to do um, all of our meetings have continued. So fostering panels continued, adoption panels continued, and people have done that virtually from their own homes using platforms such as what we're talking on now. So whilst they will go back to being face to face, we will be able to make sure that it's a bit easier and a bit more inclusive for some panel members who might not be able to get physically into a building etc so I think there's lots of things that will take away we've done we've done a piece of work looking at what using my systemic language we would like to amplify continue amplify carry on and what we would like to ditch and not carry on thank you very much because it's not been the best part of, of of our experience so there's loads of things on that that we'll be taking forward I'll just add to that as well I think we'll see more schools doing more in terms of online work as well um, so even though we are expecting all children to be back in school in September, um, schools really have, although they had a short amount of time to get to grip with it when it first happened with the lockdown, they've really begun to develop those online resources and things now. And I think we'll see more of that being used in the future. And that can only benefit the young people involved, I think. OK, thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments from cabinet colleagues? No, no. OK. OK, Sorry, thank you. Ross, I have my hand up then. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Council just, Patel, just, I, unfortunately, when we're doing a live stream, the <coughs> hand up thing doesn't work, so I can't see you. So anyway, Council Patel. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for that really, uh, and Matt, for that really detailed presentation. Just got a couple of uh, questions stroke uh, observations. Um, I, I was reading in the uh, local uh, newspapers on websites today about um, I think it was a school in Woolston that had a really good um, attendance level for its online uh, lessons and things like that um, and I was just wondering whether there's been any variance between different you know the, the, the different schools in terms of uh, take up of um, um, lessons because uh, I've heard anecdotal stories where some parents are saying they're, they're not getting enough and other parents are saying it's been absolutely brilliant um, so I'd just like to know a little bit more about the variants um, and I think the other thing I'd just like to more of an observation really is that from mid-August the I suppose the, the moratorium on debt collection and evictions and all these other uh, financial pressures that have been um, I suppose swept under the carpet temporarily because of the furlough scheme or whatever else um, will start happening again um, and I think we're going to see a surge in poverty, especially child poverty coming forward, especially, you know, around people losing more, losing their jobs, uh, people being in more debt. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how we go about mitigating some of that, because at the end of the day, it will be the children that suffer more, most, especially if their parents you know, continue to not get the help that they need. Thank you. Do you want me to go or Councillor Smith, do you want to go? Uh, I'd, I'd certainly take the school one. Okay. Um, there's, there's undoubtedly going to be variation in the on online offers from different schools. I think part of the challenge there for schools was they only found out with very short notice what was going to happen and they had a week or so to try and put things in place to change this totally new way of learning. And some schools were in better positions to deal with that than others were. Um, some of them really straight away had a full online offer. We're doing, you know, live remote lessons and all of that. Uh, others have taken a lot longer to develop those sort of approaches. Um, we're seeing that in more of the schools now, but there's still inevitably going to be that variation out there uh, as different schools have, you know, learnt, worked out how to do it best and shared that best practice and things like that. Um, I think we, we've seen a big improvement. I think that will, as I said before, I think that will benefit them into next year in September and beyond. Um, but I couldn't tell you any specific figures around how the variation is in the attendance um, for those, you know, different schools. Um, 
I think so each school we've, we've obviously got the local lockdown plans now and schools are much better prepared for moving in so if we if we haven't helped us get into that situation than, than what than what the, the, any of us were at the start of this this pandemic so um yeah i think i think there's been a lot of sector-led improvement a lot of discussions daily they started off uh, they've moved to not daily anymore they moved to every other day and then i think paul is having them um, I don't know if it's two or, or once a week now that she's talking to all of our school leaders um, collectively. So there's been a lot of cross contamination of learning and different ways of doing things. So I think I think the schools have embraced that and I think most schools are, are um, now pushing on with that. In terms of um, mid August, I think you're absolutely right, Councillor Patesh, uh, Patel, sorry, I've always said right the way from the start of this that from um, from a, a children's perspective, we will get busier as this as we come out the other end of this than when we're in the middle of it. Before the reasons that you've outlined, what the what I would say is that we're in a strong place. We've got a really effective early help service that will absolutely step fully back up at that point. Um, we've got really good partners in place and, and we're well resourced. We've reached full recruitment for social workers. I think we celebrated that with yourselves recently. Um, and I've actually over recruited by six social workers as well. So any sickness, any maternity leave, I'm no longer going to need agency cover for. So we're in a good place for us to be able to manage that demand. If we aren't able to manage that demand, then there'll need to be some conversations about what we do. But I'm not anticipating, I'm not, I'm not sat here thinking that that's where we're at at this moment in time. OK, thank you for that. And I think if we've got no further questions, um, we'll proceed um, on to the, the uh, rest of the regular meeting. So um, thank you for that really informative uh, presentation. Um, so moving on to um, the formal meeting, um, uh, just a reminder that this is being broadcast um, live. So welcome to uh, any residents from Warrington who are watching, uh, as well as any other uh, fellow council members or, or officers um, from the council. Um, the meeting is split into two parts. We have part one element, which is um, open to the public and will be broadcast. Um, and then we'll move on to part two, which is um, confidential items, and that will not be open to the public and press. Uh, and that's the point at which our broadcast will cease. Um, in terms of uh, attendees list, you've got that there. Um, unfortunately, Councillor uh, McLaughlin um, isn't well currently um, and is unable to attend tonight's meeting, so we wish her um, all the best in, in her recovery after her recent accident. Um, in terms of uh, main agenda, obviously a reminder to all members regarding the Council's code of, con uh, code of conduct and to declare any items in which they have uh, a pecuniary interest no later than when that item is raised on the agenda. Um, we've got minutes of the last meeting held on the 15th of June. Are we happy to accept those as a true record? Yes. 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 OK, thank you. I'll sign those meetings for, uh, minutes formally. Item three on the agenda is um, the Cabinet Decisions Forward Plan. Um, there are no updates to, um, to any of the um, items that they're on the forward plan, so I think that's provided for information and noting. Moving on to um, the formal business um, in what will rapidly become uh, revealed as the Councillor Cathy Mitchell show. Um, we've got item four, which is our budget monitoring report for 2019-20 um, quarter four. Councillor Mitchell, please. Thank you, Chair. So this is a report really updated on the forecast financial position for the close of the last financial year as at the end of March. It's obviously subject to change upon review by our external auditors and members will, will be aware that our accounts from 2017 to 18 and 2018 to 2019 haven't been finalised because the external auditor hasn't concluded the work at this stage. So it's subject to, to all of that. Due to COVID, the dates for the approval of accounts that have changed have been rolled forward by three months. So the new dates are the unaudited accounts uh, to be signed off by the Section 151 officer by the 31st of August 2020 and audited accounts to be published by the 30th of November 2020. So the draft headline here is that for the last financial year, the overspend was 0.295 million pounds, 295,000 pounds. 
which from a budget of £133 million is, is a massive achievement when you think of the financial situation that councils across the country are in. Um, I look at If you look at the table at 3.2, it shows you by directorate, by department, uh, where the money spent and no surprise is really families and well-being is, is one of the biggest, um, the highest funded departments that we have. I'll talk about the reserves position. The council's maintaining a robust reserves position. Some reserves are earmarked, so can't just be used for anything. They're, they're there for a particular purpose. There's no prescriptive guidance on maximum, minimum or maximum reserves. The, the requirement is to be prudent um, in, in that respect. The council is required to maintain a strategic reserve of between three to five percent of its annual budget for unexpected items of expenditure such as natural disasters. Following the severe funding cuts that we've experienced for the last 10 years, the council has maintained a medium term financial plan reserve that's used as a smoothing mechanism for unexpected and sudden reductions in funding. It's also used to pump prime invest, invest to save projects. The, uh, the M M MTFP reserve is at the end of uh, the last financial year, 4.895 million pounds. So that's, that's actually increased. So the, uh, the assessment of the financial impact of COVID-19 in the current financial year is currently ongoing. We're still waiting for information from government about how this is going to end up. And that will is likely really to have uh, an impact on the council's reserve position. So in February 2019, the council approved a budget of just under £133 million. And in that was £22.2 .2 million of savings or cuts. Since 2010-2011, the council's made over £159 million worth of saving because of underfunding by the government. It's had its budget cut by around the third. Over the next four years to 2023-24, uh, and before even taking into account the impact of COVID, the council has to achieve a further £43 million of cuts in order to balance the budget. So at, so at the start of the year, as I've just said, um, the council needed to find savings of £22.2 million. Pounds. The mo there's, there's a lot of detail in Appendix A, which is at the back of the report, but there's a diagram, a, a table at 6.1, which shows that um, the cuts that were required, the savings, 22.16. 167 million and actually achieved was 19.352 million. So that in itself is a tremendous achievement. Ten years on, there isn't the slack that you can cut out of the system. You know, you're, you're really look, having to look hard for anything that you can cut at this stage of the game. And of course, the council continues to look at innovative opportunities within corporate finance, treasury and traded services to try to put some money back in to put into the revenue. So that's uh, then, then uh, but paragraph seven of the report is summarised by the director. And what I want to home in on is families and well-being. The most significant areas of overspend across the whole of the council are in adult social care and children's services, specifically children in care division. So looking after adults who need help in the home with care and also looking after the children who are most at risk within our community. These really are the invisible services. This is not what most people see the council doing, but it's a huge amount of what we do. Obviously, people see potholes, bins needing emptying, grass needing cutting, but that's really just a tiny proportion of what we actually do. So what I will do is uh, the recommendation really just to note the report is at paragraph 13. I'll move that recommendation. Happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you for that presentation, Councillor Mitchell. Colleagues, have you got any comments or questions for Councillor Mitchell on this report? I could, if that's OK. OK, Councillor Smith. 
Um, it's a comment really, uh, but I'd just like to add a bit of context for the overspend in children's services that Councillor Mitchell already mentioned. Um, much of this overspend is from the children in care budget. Uh, so that would be children in foster placements, those placed for adoption, some living with other family members and those in residential care. Um, everyone participating in this meeting, councillors and council officers are corporate parents for these children. So we all have a parental responsibility for them. The question we must always consider is, is the provision that we make good enough for these children, the children for which we are corporate parents? Our Families First Educare team do amazing work with children uh, and their families, but ultimately we don't have full control over who will come into our care. By the nature of having come into care, these children represent some of the most vulnerable people in our town. Some of them will be very troubled and will have complex needs. Um, as corporate parents, we have to do our best for these children, providing suitable care for their needs. This care comes at a cost. Perhaps the child is a risk to themselves and needs monitoring around the clock. Uh, perhaps they need two to one round the clock care or specialised care that's not available within the town. I expect many people here will be surprised just how few children with complex needs in placements like those I've described could actually produce the overspend you see in this report. When they need us most, we provide for these children. And that is a statutory duty. We have a legal obligation to do it, but I'm still very proud of what we do in Warrington. We've already described the work of the Families First team, which was highlighted on Channel 4 during the pandemic. And we've had reports previously to Cabinet about the restructure of our children's homes uh, and the introduction of No Wrong Door and Mockingbird programmes. These will allow us to reduce the number of children in costly residential placements, whilst providing the best family-based care for their needs. Unfortunately, the DfE had to delay No Wrong Door and Mockingbird due to the pandemic, but we're now beginning to move on those again. So hopefully that gives a bit of context and a bit more background to the detail in the report and the challenges faced by children's services. The, the last point I'd make is that we wouldn't need to have this conversation if the council was properly funded by the government. Um, I see firsthand how much hard work from council officers and members goes into meeting the demands of the budget, trying everything they can to bring down the spend in an area with factors outside of their control. Our challenge here has to be to the Conservative government who gambled with vulnerable children's futures by cutting back council funding so relentlessly since 2010. OK, thank you for that. You, a response to that um, comment, Councillor Mitchell? No? OK, thank you. Any other comments or questions, colleagues? If I may. No? OK, Councillor Knowles. Um, absolutely to echo what's been said already, and I think Councillor Mitchell's absolutely right to draw attention to this. Uh, I think, um, and I'm a member of the Corporate Parenting Forum, so I'm particularly interested in, in uh, our vulnerable children as, as well as my own sort of portfolio area. Uh, but I, th I think um, some of the, the children are, are the most invisible residents who um, take up large uh, amounts of the uh, council's budget because, um, you know, rightly, there's a lot of confidentiality around those children because we want them to move on and move through their experience of having been looked after or having um, been um, supported by uh, children's services. And um, it, it's absolutely right that we, we, we don't see them and we're largely unaware. I, th I think there is a lot more awareness now than perhaps there was at the start of the COVID pandemic about adults and, and particularly older vulnerable people and the support that they get. And um, of course, we've had an awful lot of uh, volunteer support uh, in the community for those people and, and um, a real awareness that the council's had a publicity campaign about the number of older vulnerable people there are in the different wards across Warrington. But even so, unless you have a relative or um, a friend or neighbour who um, accesses those services, it's difficult to appreciate the enormity of the task that the council undertakes to make sure that very, very vulnerable people who are entitled to that support, it is statutory support, the, the, the amount of work that goes on to support those people. It's right that we do it. It would be absolutely um, inappropriate for us to uh, try and cut corners with, with people who need those services. 
but we but the money is stewarded very very carefully to ensure that as much can be done as possible um with, with the very very limited funds that there are and i'm afraid that this is political it's it's ideological really and um, national government is not funding local government in order that local government is able to do what it was set up to do uh, in, in the way that it ought to be doing it. So I, I really fear for the future unless somebody wakes up about social care for adults and children. We, we've got a policy vacuum and we've got a funding gap and uh, the consequences of that are not acceptable for, for very, very needy people. Uh, thank you for, for that observation, Councillor Knowles. I think um, over a number of years we've made the points around the inadequacy of central government funding to the council, and it's been a consistent story over that time around um, you know, the, the way that the council has to operate with both hands tied behind its back, really. Um, and you're absolutely right about um, the comments that you made regarding statutory services and also the points made by Councillor Smith. You know, um, these are people uh, in uh, you know, it, often extreme need of, of care and support, whether they be adults or children. And we don't really have a, a choice uh, about what we do. And, you know, certainly we, you know, for our, from our political choices, we want to support um, those very vulnerable residents and, and we continue to do so. I think um, you know, the, this report demonstrates um, uh, an excellent level of financial control in the council. Um, I think delivering um, a modest overspend of you know, 295,000 in a budget of that size, but also um, with the complexities of um, the budget um, cuts and savings that were being put forward, um, which is summarised in Appendix A, um, but also the ongoing demand pressures. You know, when we set a budget, we often, often don't know what's you know coming ahead in terms of the, year, um, the coming year, in terms of the level of increased demand. Um, you know, and we see that in terms of the overspending in families and wellbeing services. Uh, and we can directly pinpoint that to some of those absolutely crucial frontline services, which um, you know, just don't get seen by the vast majority of people in Warrington. I think when you look at Appendix A, um, you know, there's strong evidence there in terms of the red, amber, green ratings that you know, we've delivered a very high proportion of the planned savings. Uh, and cuts over the year and so I'd, I'd certainly want to extend my thanks to officers throughout the council for their hard work and diligence in terms of meeting the requirements of the budget um, and then of course um, in those areas where we can't deliver those savings actually finding other ways of, of saving and cutting spend throughout the year so it's been you know tremendous um, effort by all concerned um, and I imagine quite a lot of people are quite punch drunk by now we've been doing this for a decade um, but you know um, we still got a job to do. We still have to manage um, our services within the financial constraints that we've got. And so, um, you know, it's a, a commendable um, story from this report, really. So thank you for that. Do we have a seconder for this report? I'm happy to second. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it's been uh, seconded then by Councillor Knowles. And because we're doing um, a meeting via Teams, I'll have to um, go through uh, council members in turn um, and indicate whether they're for or against the um, report and the recommendations therein. So, Councillor Bowden, for. Councillor Guthrie? For. Councillor Higgins? For. <coughs> Councillor Knowles? For. Councillor Mitchell? For. Councillor Mundry? For. Councillor Patel? Four. And Councillor Smith? Four. Thank you, colleagues. That's unanimous um, support for the recommendations um, as contained in item four. Moving on then to agenda item five. Um, this is the 2021-25 pre-budget outlook report. Um, we never stand still in terms of setting the budget. So um, Councillor Mitchell is going to talk to us around the financial outlook for the council moving forward. Councillor Mitchell, please. Thanks, Chair. So this is to look at, this is an overview of the estimated level of budget savings that we're going to be, we need to have in the budget over the next four years and the assumptions that the Council will make over that period. And also to note the additional challenges arising from the COVID pandemic. 
because we've had additional costs and we've also had a loss of income during this financial year, which is got an impact on next year's budget. So when we're looking at the forecast position, there's a few assumptions are applied. Over the four year period, central government funding is forecast to be minimal. In the past, government funding used to make up most of our income and that's before austerity. But now it's dropped to virtually nothing. I can understand the frustration of people who think, well, the council tax keeps going up, but I'm not seeing more services for that. The reason for that is, is that the funding gap that's caused by the loss of that government funding is so big that if you wanted to use council tax to bridge the gap, you'd have to increase it by 40 percent. And that's not something that we can or would do. It's also expected that new homes bonus funding will progressively reduce to nil. So funding is expected to come largely from council tax, business rates, we get to keep a third of those, and fees and charges. So th there's been talk of reform from government for a long time now about moving to, instead of us getting a third of the business rates to perhaps 50% or 75%. But to be honest, that keeps getting kicked into the long grass and we've, we just keep waiting and waiting for that to happen. In, and in the meantime, the, you know, things are just getting worse. So what the, the formulation of, the, of next year's budget will be influenced by the continuation of the major cuts that central government has imposed on local government right across the country. There's also a great deal of uncertainty. You, the government won't tell us what we're going to get for the next four years so that we could plan, which would be helpful when it's difficult. We just find out last minute what we're going to get and it, that creates uncertainty and a lot of difficulty when you're trying to set a budget. That undermines the council's ability really to deliver financial planning and stability. And that's, a, that's even worse this year because we've got this COVID uncertainty. We've got a big shortfall now because we've, we've spent extra and we've lost income from our regular services and we don't know what, how that's all going to end up. So there's a table at paragraph 3.3 uh, showing the budget position over the next four year period. And I just stress that that's, that doesn't include any of any of the COVID, uh, the impact of COVID. This has been modelled on previous year's funding and uprated for inflation, etc. Further work is going to be required on this and it, we're really anticipating that the, the situation is going to get worse, not better here. So on the basis of, of all of that, it's forecast that the council will need to make savings of £38 million over the next four years, with £21.6 million of the savings being required in the next financial year. Covid also impacts on the budget because the budget that was set in February this year required us to make £14.1 million worth of cuts. Now, because of COVID and just because of COVID, £8.1 million of that is now identified as being unachievable. And the additional £6 million is at further risk of delay. So that's going to have a direct impact on next year's budget, but we don't know at this stage what exactly that impact will be. The, the council has been submitting returns to government to show all the losses that we've, we've experienced from all different sources. So looking at the wider impacts, um, the economy, this COVID pandemic has, is going to impact us globally, uh, not just locally. So as of June 2020, there's a, there is a global uh, recession forecast and it's estimated it'll last about two years. That's going to create challenges for us in the local authorities because there's going to be shrinkage of the local business sector, potential job losses, risks of increased inequality and deprivation, which will create demand on local services such as housing benefit and social care. And also at the same time, it's going to be reducing income from sources such as council tax, business rates and fees and charges, which we rely so heavily upon. 
Thankfully, Warrington has a diverse economy and that might shield us here from some of the worst effects of this economic fallout. For example, the logistics system, uh, sector has performed strongly throughout the pandemic as, as UK people have, have increased internet shopping. Amiga is the home to a large cluster of logistics companies and there's an inward, in, an inward investment in food distribution, distribution could bring another thousand jobs to the area. The nuclear sector at Birchwood typ typically operates with long term government contracts, so that should avoid the worst of the downturn. However, Warrington residents can, will be affected by what's going on around us. Bentley are making 1500 staff redundant, 1600 at risk at Airbus. Jan Jaguar Land Rover and Vauxhall will also be losing workers as the automotive sector is going to take a, a lot of time to recover from this. So unemployment's more than doubled in Warrington to 4.6%. And there's 24,500 24 people currently on furlough. So that, that, number of that employment number is expected to rise when that scheme ends in October. Another way that the council cr can create income and what it has actually done is used investments to try to make some more money so that we can keep services going. And when we're talking about the property portfolio, in hitting the headlines recently, you've got other, other councillors who, who've, say, invested in an airport. It's absolutely critical that if you're going to do investments like this, that you have a diverse portfolio and don't put all your eggs in one basket, which is what we've done in Warrington. We, we've got a very diverse portfolio, which has held up well to the, the COVID challenge. So the gross income from the property portfolio of the council is over £33 million a year. 90% of that comes from the, the properties we've invested in since 2016. And that, and that new newer investment portfolio has, has really stood up well to the COVID pandemic. And it's going to continue to give us a net income. Uh, you know, it'll be slightly lower than before, but it's an important net income to the council to help us to support services. Some of the strengths of what we've got is that less than 5% of our income is derived from non-food retail. You know, the food companies have done very well through COVID. 35% of our income comes from the four, top four paying tenants, which are food stores and logistics businesses, as I say, who've, who've weathered COVID well. A number of the properties that we've got benefit from long leases, which expire, you know, after 2030. So that's that's locked in income until probably after all of this and um, the effects of COVID have played out at the long term income stream. The local government association estimate that extra COVID-19 costs, costs and losses of income incurred by councils in March, April and May amounted to £3.2 billion. Pounds. And the estimate of how much this is all going to cost councils in the end is more like £10 billion. Pounds. And the government at the moment is offering a fraction of that. This is, and this is the worry. We, we've no idea what, what they're going to do. So if you look at paragraph 4.6, this, this was the returns forwarded to government in June. And you can see at that point, the estimate for the full year total loss is £42.6 million. Pounds. To date, we've received £11.1 million pounds from government, which is way short of what we need. There has been another settlement, well, there's another settlement, but we don't know how much we're getting from that. But we, we don't expect it. It won't bring us anywhere near where we need to be. The shortfall presently is £31.5 million. Pounds. Of course, the council does have reserves and could use reserves towards footing the bill for this, some of these COVID costs. But that would leave us in a very vulnerable position when you look at the overall funding situation that we're facing before you even bring COVID into it. And it would leave, leave us at risk if we were to let go of reserves for this. So. 
obviously we've got this portfolio, property portfolio that pr produces an income for us. Uh, it's a strong, a strong asset management of that will continue. It's, it's always under review. It's constantly looked at. So I move to education. Um, there's updated, updated guidance on flexibility within schools to allow more pupils to return. And that might increase financial pressures within these settings to ensure that they're able to offer these increased places, but still remain within the COVID guidelines. So that could be pressures in, in with, with school meals, for instance. Looking at the local care sector, the council's taken a number of proactive steps to support the care sector throughout the COVID pandemic. That's regular conference calls, there was dedicated email and phone lines, provision of information, advice, trying to get PPE to them and payments to support payment, advance payments to support them going forward. Care homes have been the sector most impacted by this. And they just they've played a huge part in the national response. The council introduced an occupancy subsidy scheme to take steps to avoid any of the care homes failing and to support their ongoing financial viability to meet both current and future needs. These are our most vulnerable residents and it's our priority to protect and support them going forward in care homes. Cultural le uh, leisure and libraries. The Livewire site closed in March 2020, which resulted in a significant drop in customer income. They produced recovery projections and a phased reopening of their sites and services. That's starting with the hub sites in July. Because of COVID, they are currently projecting a full year 2021 deficit. The position with Culture Warrington is a bit better. Although they're losing income, they do have reserves. And they've also benefited from government initiatives such as the furlough scheme. The council maintains an open dialogue and support for the managing director and finance director in both organisations. So I'll move to the recommendation, which is at paragraph 11, uh, asking the cabinet to note that position. I'll move that recommendation. Happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you to Council Mitchell for that comprehensive uh, presentation of um, the financial issues in, in our budget setting. Have we got any comments or questions from members? Can I just make an observation? Councillor Guthrie. Yes, um, one of the things that, that you mentioned, Councillor Mitchell, in your presentation was to do with the hidden effects of COVID. The ones that we've not felt yet is, is a problem. Um, it's been a real issue in maintaining waste services because obviously waste has increased as lockdown has been brought on. People have been sort of throwing lots more uh, rubbish away because they've been furloughed at home. Um, so there's been an increase in residual and plastic waste. Um, and this will continue due to all the changes that, that we have in place. And people, you know, unless they go straight back to work, which is which it will not happen, um, these changes will still continue. Um, the government doesn't make any of our money up, uh, as you know that, and we just we just have to manage with what we've got. Um, but I'd just like to congratulate all our waste services operatives who have continued to deliver um, this vital service. Um, our bin men have turned out every day to make sure the town has been cleaned um, and all the sort of bins have been regularly emptied because we've continued our waste streams but going forward it will be a challenge in terms of how much our contracts will cost in the future because of the increase in in waste that we are producing at the moment thank you okay can thank I, you can i come in russ yeah councillor mundry yes i think it's um what what's demonstrating? I think we started some years ago. I think as a forward-thinking council, is our investment program, and how dependent we are we coming on this to provide services to the citizens of Warrington. I think we're forward-thinking council, and other council looking at what how we manage to achieve things. And I think that's as done an excellent job in ensuring that our investments are spread across, so we're not all say all eggs are not in one basket. We take uh, 
careful steps to make sure that we make uh, measured investments and the people of Warrington are benefited from this. They may not realise how much to benefit by, by this, but if it's over £30 million, pounds, as Cathy said, had we not done this, there's lots of services and a lot of vulnerable people wouldn't be getting what they need from the council. So uh, I, I think we sort of don't say enough about it, is we just get on and do the job and get on with uh, getting resources in for the people of Warrington. And we, we don't seem to mention quite, a lot of it, not a lot of it is mentioned anywhere, is how a forward thinking council, the way we've moved forward, the way we invest in things, and the way we've actually brought money into the council for to benefit the people of Warrington. No, thank you for that comment, Councillor Mundry. I, I totally um, agree with you. I, I think um, we do try and say exactly that. You know, we do try and get that message out around what the net um, revenue income is to the council from these kind of investments. Um, uh, but you're right, we can probably say it, keep on saying it and, and remind the, the people of Warrington what it is that the council's done, what the driver for that is. It's not, it's not to invest in property because we think that's what council should do. It's actually to keep the show on the road, um, to keep on providing those vital frontline services um, for people, um, particularly the most vulnerable. But um, uh, I'll never tire of, of, uh, of putting that message across. Any other comments or questions from anybody? Uh, yes, Councillor Borden. Councillor Higgins. Well, I, I think it goes without saying that without these intelligent investments we make in Warrington, I'm responsible for what you, for what you would term the nice things, Walton Hall, parks and gardens, over a hundred in Warrington, 17 community centres, libraries, leisure centres, all the nice things, the things we take for granted. Without the intelligent investments, these facilities simply wouldn't be around. They would be probably closed. But we've been extremely intelligent the way we've invested, the way we've used our money, the way we've used the small income fr uh, streams from those develop, uh, investments for our 17 centres, for the, the money we've committed to invest in the refurbishment of the libraries. And this is because we run a sound budget, sound investments, and we will continue to do that. So I think people need to be reminded about all the nice things we do, whether that's Victoria Park and the 3G pitch and the playing pitch strategy. These are things which we could easily put to one side and say we have other priorities such as adult so, uh, services, such as children's services, all those things that people do see. But we continue to do the nice things because that's what people expect us to do. But it does come with a cost and that cost is getting greater and the challenges are even getting greater still. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that comment, Councillor Higgins. Any other offers from members? A quick one from me, a slight different tack, if that's all right. Of um, course, Councillor just, just to say that um, one thing Councillor Mitchell mentioned was uh, the need to sort of stabilise certain things. I think coming out of COVID, we mustn't make any knee-jerk decisions. Uh, it, it's a time to reflect on what's needed. We, we don't know whether there's going to be a second wave. We don't know how this is going to play out. So uh, much as Amanda Amesbury talked about earlier and Councillor Smith, um, we don't know how things are going to play out in schools in terms of the local care market, which we have a duty to monitor. That's going to be something that we need to stabilise in the short term so that we can reflect in the slightly longer term about how that how that's going to play out. So um, I, th I think that does create an extra challenge this year because it's uh, it's probably the time of year where we would really be implementing um, some of the uh, decisions that that uh, enable us to save money. But we just have to um, hold our nerve a little bit, see how things are working out and um, see how this all evolves. And I hope that in the meantime, we get some additional funding from the government because uh, without it, it's it's uh, an incredibly tough job. So it's it's about the attention to detail and the real reflection on, on how to go forward and how to reset things locally in the best way we possibly can. Thank you for that excellent comment. Any other comments from members? No. Um, 
I think I, a couple of quick observations then, um, Councillor Mitchell. I think um, the table in um, section 4.6 is really helpful. Um, and I think seeing the full year impact of COVID-19 um, on the council's financial position is, is really crucial. Um, well, what we've seen so far, if you focus on the, the, um, the data to the end of July, it looks like government is broadly financing the financial cost to councils. And what we shouldn't forget is the words of um, the Chancellor and the words of the MHCLG, um, Secretary of State, regarding councils getting on with spending and the money would follow. And what we're not seeing is any evidence that the full costs of COVID are going to be met, um, despite the best efforts of, of councils throughout the, um, the last few months. And of course, you know, it, there's been a lot of national focus, and rightly so, on, on the great work of um, NHS staff. Um, but let's, you know, we also need to remind government that um, a lot of council workers have been at that front line of COVID as well, um, you know, as key workers, particularly in, in care homes and the care sector. Um, and, you know, they're, they're our heroes, if you like, um, and we need to be properly funded for the work that they've um, done. Um, in terms of the investment portfolio, I think there was a very comprehensive summary of, um, of uh, the performance of that. And obviously we've got agenda item seven as well. Um, but I think, that, again, that's testament to the work that we've done, a lot of due diligence, um, a lot of uh, external advice regarding what we've invested in and ensuring that we've got a broad portfolio that is robust, resilient to you know um, the economic kind of uh, weather, if you like. Um, and you know the evidence is that that is holding up very strongly, certainly compared to national averages. Um, I look at Manchester, for example. You know the the ten Agma authorities are looking at a hundred million pound loss of income this year, for example, from Manchester Airport. Um, Luton Borough Council um, the same. I think it's around thirty seven million from Luton Airport that they're not going to see, and they're now in a position of having to take. An emergency budget to um, to their council, so I think it is testament to the work that we've done over a number of years to to develop that um, property portfolio um, and to have an investment um, strategy which continues to deliver even in such difficult times as now. So going back to the finances, um, the local government association says that the bill is something like 13.2 billion pounds um, in terms of genuine losses to to councils. Um, and government so far has funded around a quarter of that. And I can't help keep making the comparison with um, the NHS, where historic debts of around £10 billion were written off by government with one stroke of a pen at the start of COVID-19. You know, if they made the same kind of commitment to local government, then we wouldn't be talking um, about uh, these kind of financial impacts on councils. And, you know, even last week, you know, £1.5 billion to um, the arts and culture sector. Yeah, inevitably, they have suffered um, during COVID-19, yeah, particularly with the inability to open arts and cultural facilities and put on performances. But again, in perspective, that's around half of um, what's been provided to local government so far, you know, at the very front line of um, COVID-19 and the response nationally. So um, I think we've got to keep on the pressure uh, we've written another number of letters to um, to the Treasury and to other um, to the Secretary of State for um, local government, and we just need to keep reminding them exactly what it is uh, that councils do and what the genuine costs and impacts have been. Um, I think at the moment there's a lot of shilly shallying. There's a, a lot of attempts to kind of portray loss of income as you know council speculation, but um, it's clearly nothing of the sort. You know there are. A lot of increased costs and there's a lot of lost income associated with that and that's that's clear from this report and um, do we have a, a seconder for this report then yes councillor borden i will okay thank you councillor higgins uh, it's been moved and seconded then so we go to the vote in the same way as previously councillor bowden four councillor guthrie four councillor higgins yes four councillor knowles four Councillor Mitchell? Four. Councillor Mundry? Four. Councillor Patel? Four. Councillor Smith? Four. Thank you, colleagues. That's unanimous. Moving on then to agenda item six, COVID-19 procurement arrangements. Um, this is an update on uh, the activity that's um, 
taken place since the last cabinet meeting um, under those uh, uh, procurement rules and uh, PPN um, guidance. Councillor Mitchell, please. Thank you, Chair. So when COVID broke out, emergency powers were given to the councils to allow them to enter into or modify contracts without having to tender for them, etc., and go through all those processes. And as, as uh, Chair's just said, this is a monthly update showing where those powers have been used and the purpose of bringing it to Cabinet is for transparency. So the one that I'm going to talk about this month is the provision of food parcels for shielding individuals. The Council established a safe and well service with local partners to provide wellbeing checks and additional support to vulnerable residents. And that included the provision of food, food parcels to people who were shielding. So there were, the, the council were in contact with a number of suppliers, uh, which the orders technically went over for up to £151,000. Um, but it's anticipated that there will be an ongoing need for the food boxes up to the end of July. And there might even be even more if there's a second wave of COVID. So this has supported the local economy. And just to give you an idea of how it's been, we've supported the local economy. The Safe and Well team, uh, working in partnership with Warrington Voluntary Action, have supported 1,700 residents over the, over the last few weeks. They've given reassurance calls, they've pres collected prescriptions, they've walked dogs. Um, in terms of food, there have been 4,703 allocations of food. That amounts to around 23,500 bags of shopping. And you can see that's a huge undertaking. And I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in that, both the staff, Warrington Voluntary Action and volunteers. I'll then move then to the recommendation, which is at paragraph 11, asking Cabinet to support and approve the actions taken and to delegate responsibility to carry on doing this. Um, so I'll move that recommendation and more than happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you for that, Councillor Mitchell. Have we got any comments or questions, colleagues? Yes, uh, Councillor Borden. Councillor Higgins. Yeah, well, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the Safe and Well team who were based uh, at the uh, Fernhead Community Centre. I think the team who had previously all worked in, whether that was at the uh, Offord Festival offices or uh, numerous community centres, all moved seamlessly into taking up that task of providing the Safe and Well to the Shielded. Uh, and they did that with uh, uh, exemplary uh, you know, uh, accreditation on that. And uh, I, I want to place on record my thanks to the team. If I could add a comment. Yeah, Councillor Knowles. I think a number of us, um, I, I know uh, when you and I visited Councillor Bowden, um, Councillor Higgins was there. Um, th the operation that's that's taken place at Fernhead has been truly impressive. Uh, and I think today there's been news about children suffering from malnutrition. There's one thing about being fed and there's one thing about being fed properly. And uh, it was very apparent going and visiting the uh, offer at, uh, at Fernhead that the food that was going into those parcels was decent. And maybe at the beginning it was seen that this was going to be a very temporary thing. But when you think that people have been living on this food for months and months. It's absolutely imperative that it contain fresh vegetables and, you know, decent nutritious food that people could actually live on and, and you know, dare I say, enjoy eating because, um, you know, it's it's been a very difficult time. People are shielding because they often are unwell and um, they, they are in need of decent sustenance. So I, I think it's it's been really heartening to see actually local fruit and veg and um, other locally supplied produce going into those parcels as well. Well done, everyone who's been involved. Thank you. That's a really nice comment. Um, and I, I agree with uh, the comment made by um, Councillor Higgins and yourself there regarding um, the safe and well service. I think um, it's been testament again to, um, to the work of council officers, but also to, to volunteers. Um, and you know it's really refreshing to see those volunteers wanting to um, 
take part to support their community uh, and that's you know continued for a number of months now so well done to everybody have we got any other comments or questions no in which case do we have a seconder for this report i'll second it russ okay it's been seconded by councillor Guthrie. Um, in which case we move to the vote um, in the same way as previously. Councillor Bowden, four. Councillor Guthrie, four. Councillor Higgins, four. Councillor Knowles, four. Councillor Mitchell, four. Councillor Mundry, four. Councillor Patel, four. And Councillor Smith, four. Okay, thank you, colleagues. That's unanimous. Moving on then to um, agenda item seven. Um, this is an update on um, the performance of our non-treasury investments um, in the year to date. Councillor Mitchell, please. Thank you, Chair. It's been the council policy over the last few years to invest in non-treasury management investments for, the com for a combination of generating revenue for the council and to do regeneration projects as well. The por portfolios performed well during 1920 and it's produced the planned investment return to the council. So the report that is mainly in part two deals with commercial property portfolio and the corporate loans portfolio. Now, when you're looking at investments like this, councils would not be doing this if they were properly funded by government. So anybody who's a critic of it needs to think, well, what else would you have us do? There would be two options. Um, uh, we've, we've talked at length really about the dire financial situation that councils across the country are facing. There's no government grant now for Warrington, so we've got council tax, business rates, fees and charges. We've got increased demand and we've got less resources than we've ever had before. That leaves you really with two options. You either cut services or you do something about increasing income. So what the council's done is invested in property like a buy to let. You can spend money, but you've still got a property to show for that, like when you buy your house. So you could sell it back if you, to, to pay back the borrowing if you wanted to do that, if it was the right thing to do. But obviously you wouldn't get the income then that it's producing. The net income that we get from our properties is about £20 million a year. That's after all of the costs of borrowing that's in all the costs of looking after the property, etc., have been taken out. It might be a little bit less after COVID, but it's still a significant amount of money for this council on top of what it gets. And it helps us to keep services. And my colleagues in the cabinet have referred to all these important services that, that don't have to be cut or don't have to be cut as much because of the action the council have, ta have taken. And I thank all of the officers involved in this in this probe program. So I will move then to the recommendation, uh, which is at paragraph nine of the report, and that's just to note the report and move that recommendation and happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you for that, Councillor Mitchell. Have we got any comments or questions from colleagues? No, I, I, I would have been surprised if we had any comments or questions because clearly yeah, you know, I, a lot of the detail um, actually rests in part two. Yeah, can I just come in there? You briefly? can. Sorry, is that Paul Clisby? It is, yes, sorry. Um, just it was just a clarification on the, mo on the movement. I think the first part of the recommendation was moved, but not, ne not necessarily the second part, which I'm small numeral two. I just wanted to confirm that it was okay as per the recommendation. Yeah, it, my apologies. It includes section two, which is to approve the potential change in loan structure. Okay, thank you for that, Paul, and thank you for the clarification, Kathy. And um, obviously, a lot of the detail here is in in the part two report, and um, uh, you know, for reasons of commercial confidentiality. But I think the really important part is what you talked about in gross terms. You know, the net income to to the council um, from all of these investments, um, which obviously goes directly into supporting the council's uh, revenue budget, and I think that's that's really crucial. Um, and obviously, how well that has performed. We talked about it in uh, under agenda item five, but 
it's continued to perform very well throughout um, the COVID-19 crisis. And, and I think that's you know a point that we, we really do need to stress. Um, you made a really good point in terms of the value of our assets as well. So we've invested in strong assets which um, haven't declined in value. In fact, they've grown in value um, you know, since those were made. They continue to deliver a very strong uh, income stream for the council, um, and it is a long-term income stream. And, uh, and I think uh, you know we'll we'll probably cover a lot of the detail under part two. But you know, my headline message for the people of Warrington um, who may be watching tonight is that you know that investment strategy continues to perform very well. Um, it's not. Um, uh, failing in the current situation and indeed it continues to perform a very strong um, and provide a very strong source of revenue to the council which is direct to their services so um, you know I commend again yourself and the officers involved for um, you know continuing to drive that strategy forward. Do we have a seconder for this report? I'll second it. Okay uh, Councillor Smith in which case move to the vote then. Councillor Bowden for Councillor Guthrie? Four. Councillor Higgins? Four. Councillor Knowles? Four. Councillor Mitchell? Four. Councillor Mundry? Four. Councillor Patel? Sorry, four. Okay. Councillor Smith? Four. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Um, that's unanimous. Um, moving on to agenda item eight then, which is an update on Together Energy. Um, at this point, um, Stephen Broomhead is, is going to uh, leave the meeting. Um, he is a, a member of the board of Together Energy um, and therefore he does have an, an interest in this item um, and he'll rejoin us um, for the part two uh, section of tonight's cabinet meeting. Um, so, uh, Councillor Mitchell, please. Thank you, Chair. So the purpose of this report is to update Cabinet on a potential change of supplier of energy for Together and also potential growth in the customer base. The Council purchased a 50% stake in Together Energy in, two, in October 2019. And you know, what I should say is some of, some of the things that the Council invests in are to produce an income and, and this is certainly one of those, but also there are other benefits from having a, an energy company such as being able to provide people with energy that's affordable. So the most of this is in part two of the report, but I just wanted to bring out a few a few facts about Together Energy. So at the moment, there are, there's been 11 local jobs created, and that was pe for people who were previously unemployed. And at the moment, Together are interviewing for a further 10 positions. Together are wanting to potentially switch to a green supplier so that 100% renewable energy will be available for Together Energy customers. So further steps are now being taken by the council to deal with the climate emergency. So we don't just talk about it, we get things done. There's also a potential to significantly increase the number of customers which will help to grow the business. Together Energy offer fixed energy tariffs which help to give people security knowing how much they have to pay going forward and that's important when families are trying to budget for energy and could help with fuel poverty and the customer the customer service at one point wasn't great but that's now improving and a lot of work has gone in in the company to try to make that a better experience for customers so i'll move to paragraph 10 of the report which is the recommendation I won't read all of that out, but I'll move that recommendation. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. OK, thank you for that, Councillor Mitchell. Um, obviously, the, the uh, recommendation is just picking up on Paul's point from the previous item. You're moving all of those specific recommendations in relation to Together Energy's business plan, etc. OK, thank you. And any comments or questions from colleagues? I've got a comment, Russ. OK, Councillor Mundry. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say I, I do remember the long debates we had on, on, on this this, uh, this item before we'd actually engaged in the 50% ownership of the company. I think it's proved again a, a wise decision for us to make. It takes a lot of the issues that we wanted to do. We, we did want an energy company. We've got one 
Now, well in advance where we would have been, had we gone down the route we were looking at previous to this, I think it's a, another one of them things where we've made the right decision at the right time. And I think the people of Warrington will be benefiting from this again, not only the income, but our, our other ambitions was to make sure that we can deliver a service for the citizens of Warrington at a, at a cost that where we have some in, in, we have some impact on how, on how much it gets charged to the citizens of Warrington. I think we really have made, made moved forward on this and we are able to deliver for Warrington people. And again, on, on a business point of view again, and it wasn't the major issue to make money on this company. The major issue was to actually deliver to the poorest of our, of our town. And I think we're able to do that. And again, we've made a, a wise business choice on this again, where we've safeguarded our, ourselves as a, as, a, as a council, but we've safeguarded a future for the most poorest of our society. So I, I really would like to re recommend the work with what's been done on this by Cathy and the officers. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Monday. I, I totally agree. And I remember those um, long discussions as well um, at the back end of last year. Um, yeah. I think I think Cathy made the point as well in terms of um, a lot of our investments aren't just around generating income. They are quite clearly policy driven. Um, and, and you're absolutely right to raise the point about Together Energy in terms of tackling fuel poverty, in terms of you know providing access to um, green energy, for example. Also, you know, um, making the obvious links with our solar farms and providing a way of, of supplying electricity to um, to the grid or to other users. Um, and then obviously, you know, potentially being able to be of benefit to everyone in Warrington. You know, a, a municipal approach, if you like, through through um, the council's uh, investments in solar farms, uh, which everybody can can take a part in. Um, and I think I'm really, really encouraged around the uh, the employment opportunities as well. You know, I, I know last week um, that uh, the people from Warrington that have already been recruited by Together Energy were up in Clydebank um, receiving their training. You know, that's the first 11 of long term uh, unemployed young people from Warrington who are being given an opportunity um, to have a job um, through Together Energy and long may that continue as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of really positive social um, benefits that we get from Together Energy. I think uh, Councillor Mitchell was honest about um, where the company was at at the time that we um, invested, but all of the indications and, and metrics from the company are about a very positive direction of travel now, an improved customer um, service uh, interaction for, for customers, um, growing the, the number of customer accounts, and obviously starting to have that impact here in Warrington. So um, yeah, absolutely agree with you, Councillor Mundine, commending all the officers uh, involved and obviously um, Cathy for taking the lead on it. Any other comments or questions? No, okay, we've got a seconder for the report. I'll, I'll second it. Okay, it's been seconded by Councillor Mundry then. Uh, if we move to the vote, um, Councillor Bowden, four. Councillor Guthrie. Oh. Councillor Higgins. Four. Councillor Knowles. Four. Councillor Mitchell. Four. Councillor Mundry. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. OK, thank you. That's unanimous as well. Um, at this stage, um, that's the end of the part one meeting. Um, can I move part two now, please? I'll second that, Chair. Okay.